Blog Talk Radio. Radio. I'm your host and founder of Alzheimer Speaks, Lori LeBay. For those of you that are new to the show, um, Alzheimer Speaks is an advocacy-based company providing multiple platforms to shift our dementia care from crisis to comfort around the world. We believe that by joining forces and sharing knowledge and having these everyday conversations about life with dementia, that we're going to be able to remove the stigmas attached to memory loss and help people live with the disease, not as it. Together, I know we can make a huge difference difference and bring back dignity to those that uh, feel like it's it's fallen astray from this illness. At our core with Alzheimer's Speaks, uh, we believe that collaboration is really going to be the key to battling dementia. And I know that we're winning um, this fight, even though it might seem like we're not, um, because Alzheimer Speaks was lucky enough to be recognized as the number one influencer online, according to ShareCare, which is the largest health and wellness website in the world, and Dr. Oz. And that didn't happen because of what we're doing. It happened because of what you're doing, your likes, your clicks, your shares with your um, Google circles, with your Facebook friends, with your LinkedIn colleagues, is making a difference. You see, when we share knowledge and when we share information and resources, we put it out there for others to grab when they're ready. And many times we don't know of people in our own circles, can even be uh, family, close family and friends that are, are dealing with dementia but kind of haven't come out of the closet yet because of the stigma. So I I really encourage you to share all of our radio episodes, our blog posts, um, our resource website. Be part of the community that's just out there to raise everyone's voice so that people can find the information when they need it. Um, And again, from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank you for for all, all you are doing. Um, to shift our dementia care culture and help raise awareness. On on our calls here, every show, um, you have an opportunity to call in. If you have a question or a comment for our guest, please don't hesitate to do so. This is a a very casual conversation. That's what it's meant to be. We want to hear everyone's voice. So feel free to call in to 714-364-4700. Five seven again. That is seven one four three six four four seven five seven. Or you can always use the chat box as well, and I'll be monitoring uh, questions and comments as we go uh, from there as well. <clears throat> now, before I enter introduce our first guest and we have we have some fabulous guests today um, doing some really really neat work I always like to give a shout out to some organizations and concepts that I I don't think everyone is aware of and the first one is the Purple Angel Project um, for those of you that aren't familiar with the Purple Angel the Purple Angel with the globe is the new global symbol for dementia uh, that everybody can use it doesn't cost anything you just have to read a little poster, and then you can help raise awareness. You can put it on your Facebook. You can put it on websites, on your your businesses, um, et cetera. And the goal is to get um, people to ask, what's the Purple Angel, so that we can start having a conversation about dementia. 
another organization is ADI or Alzheimer's Disease International. And Alzheimer's Disease International is actually the organization of all Alzheimer's associations around the world. So no matter where you're listening from, no matter where you live or, or where a loved one of yours has a need, Alzheimer's Disease International can hook you up with the closest Alzheimer's Association in your area. There is also a wealth of global information there, so you'll hear the latest on the, the G7 summits and some of the international research that's taking place. If you're um, local here like me in Minnesota, um, one of my my favorite people to work with and favorite companies is Hellstar Home Health. Um, they are doing just an absolutely brilliant job here in Minnesota, really changing how home health is delivered for those dealing with dementia. And so I would encourage you to check them out if you're in need um, of having someone assist you. Their staff are trained through the Alzheimer's Whisper program program to really um, help promote better care, and they share that knowledge uh, with, with those that hire them, the caregivers, so their jobs become easier as well. <clears throat> For people who are interested in a more holistic approach to care, um, I recommend you check out the Alzheimer's Research and Prevention Foundation. Uh, there you're going to find information on diet and exercise and meditation, how to reduce stress, um, or just a great organization. And then many people are dealing with specific types of dementia, not just Alzheimer's, but maybe it's Lewy body or frontal temporal lobe, or maybe they're having problems with speech. And there are national organizations specific to those. So check out the Lewy Body Dementia Association or the Association for Frontal Temporal uh, Degeneration or the National Aphasia Association, um, which again has to do with uh, speech. And then I'm, of course, a big um, music uh, component I think is, is really important when it comes to dementia. I, I've just seen so many people react so positively, and you've seen, um, you know, the YouTube clips and hopefully the movie Alive Inside, <clears throat> The Power of Music. There's also a company called Alzheimer's Music Connect that has great music um, that has a pending patent that helps people connect for longer periods of time after after they've listened to the music. And you can't tell by listening. It's just great everyday music. So um, I would highly encourage you to check out Alzheimer's Music Connect. And then um, many people just like to do puzzles. There's a company called Puzzle With Me that has designed puzzles that are bigger pieces, more age appropriate, and fewer pieces to put together. Um, and Jane Snyder has done a, a great job with that. Uh, the Jiminy Wicket program will be the last one that I'll mention. And that it can be used um, in a couple of different ways. It's an adaptive croquet game that really is a lot of fun. It can be used educationally between schools and memory care uh, communities, or uh, people can play it as families or um, within their own communities. And people can play in wheelchairs. It's it's a very fun um, and, and not expensive game uh, to be able to play, and it can be played indoors or outdoors, which again, is, um, is a very neat in and of itself. So with all of that being said and done, I'm really excited to introduce our first guest here. We have Ashley Kwan with us today, and she has dreamed of opening her own care home for seniors since uh, she had her first co-op experience in high school at the age of 17 years old. And as soon as Ashley graduated from high school, she made steps in her life to gain knowledge and experience to be qualified to re realize her dream. She has looked at healthcare, um, at the healthcare industry, um, pretty much every day of her life, with an entrepreneurial sense on how was she going to make her mark in this industry. And I really believe she has come up with a fabulous, fabulous concept that she's going to share with us today. Um, she lives in Canada, and there she recognized some health gaps. Um, in the care industry, and she's really focused on um, future change and community-based services, and she came up with this idea of a health club 
for people with Alzheimer's and other related dementias. And she is in the process of bringing that dream and that concept um, to life. It's called Memory and Company. And um, you're going to hear from Ashley. You'll just be able to hear from the tone of her voice how dedicated she is. You're going to hear her passion and how she lives with it daily uh, to make a difference and, and how evident and powerful that is. And, and what she has done, you know, over the past 17 years in her senior care industry um, so I'm excited to introduce uh, you to Ashley Kwong. Ashley, how are you today? I'm good. Thanks, Lori. Well, I am I am so excited about what you are doing. I um this is an idea that I, I think so many people in the industry have talked about but nobody's you know, nobody's kinda cut the bread and butter and actually done it. And um I, I think it's <laughs> So, so needed. So can you tell people um, why did you decide to create Memory and Company and exactly what is it? Okay. So um, as you as you said, you know, I've worked with people with dementia since I was a teenager. And I've witnessed, you know, some really upsetting care and treatment of individuals with dementia because they couldn't advocate for themselves and, and felt, you know, the system really neglected those that needed our help the most. So I vowed then uh, that I would do something about it. So, you know, I, I went back to school, um, you know, went through, the, went through the system to, you know, learn more about it, um, joined, a, joined a company and uh, Sunrise Senior Living, um, and you know, got my foot in the door there, and uh, learned you know the the basics of care. Um, you know, I was a med tech. I get, was a caregiver. Um, I ran the Alzheimer's neighborhood for three years as well, and then I was the executive director there. And you know, I've. I went and I, you know, I met with many families um, over the years and, you know, wanted to really keep, um, you know, I wanted to improve the quality of care and, and keep people at home longer. Well, it's uh, it's just a, a fascinating, I think, concept and it, it um it amazes me sometimes the vision that people have at such a young age and your pursuit of that. Um, a lot of people would have given up. And I think a lot of people have. You know, we, we think of ideas and go, eh, you know, it's going to be too much work. It's going to be too hard. But you, we've really pursued um, this path and, and learned over the years and, and talked with people. What are some of the challenges that you faced in terms of creating your, your company? Because I'm sure there had to have been quite a few of them. Uh, oh, yes, definitely. You know, creating an Alzheimer's health club and, you know, the, the day program environment, they, people really didn't know, you know, what it was, how it was going to work. You know, people are used to being in, you know, it was the institutionalized environment. You know, I went to the cities and, you know, the only place that I could get, uh, you know, the against the the zoning was, you know, that it had to be attached to a long-term care facility or it had to be in an institutional area. People are trying to put us into um, industrial parkways, and it wasn't a place that, you know, I wanted to go to or an environment. I wanted to really de-institutionalize Alzheimer's care. And, you know, people didn't need to be in a, in a heavy health care environment. People needed to be in a place that was empathetic, supported them, and in, in a beautiful environment, and in, not in an institutional environment. Um, so, you know, the cities and the, and the towns um, really, really struggled with, you know, getting outside of, thinking outside of the box, and that seniors and people with dementia didn't need to be hiding away. Um, so when we finally, you know, we went through five or six different towns um, locally um, to, to try to find a place that, that we were allowed to be in. So it took us two years to find a spot that was, you know, ideal, um, that, you know, had the outside space, you know, one floor, um, open concept, and really wheelchair accessible, um, and, and a place that, you know, the, it met all the, the town requirements, and we had to get, uh, you know, our minor variants and, you know, meeting all the bylaw requirements and, and regulations of the, of the city. So, you know, it was, uh, it was a long process and, you know, we had to change some of the, the books with the town and, <laughs> and get that changed um, so yeah, it was it was really breaking a lot of the of the the mindset of of where we had to be. 
Oh yeah, what um, what type of response have you have you gotten from people once you started pushing this in motion? Um, a, a really really positive response. You know, families finally saying, you know. Finally, I mean, I even saw a gentleman this morning come in, you know, having me as we're renovating, you know, I'm, I'm having all the construction workers coming in and so many of even the men I'm meeting coming in while we're doing construction um, are going, my, my parent has dementia or, oh my God, finally something like this is available to, you know, meeting you know, the people in the industry um, that are going, you know, we've been talking about, thinking about this forever, but nobody's ever done it um, or, you know, it's just finding you know finding a way so um you know families have been been really really positive um about having you know another option available to them um and and in an environment that anybody would want to be in you know it's it's you know removing the assembly style of care and treating people with the dignity and respect that they deserve even while they're going through this this disease, this very challenging disease, and giving the caregivers, you know, the, the support that they need and giving the caregivers a place that they can be proud to have their loved one come out for the day, come to for the day, and, and in a guilt-free environment, you know, so when they drop them off, they're going, you know, I'm, I'm taking my loved one to the health club for the day and in, in, a, in a very adult-oriented style, um, you know, and focusing on, you know, their health and well-being while the caregivers are looking after their own health and well-being at the, at the same time, which is so important. Oh, definitely. Now, now Ashley, you had talked about renovation. Are you um, starting from scratch or were you a health club to begin with that um, is just changed your mode or, or an adult day originally when you, when you speak of renovation? Yes. Yeah, so what we, we did was we, we searched around everywhere and we found an actually an office space, an 11,000 square foot office space um, that uh, had uh, health club zoning. Um, so we were allowed to re, you know, get a minor variance in, in changing the, in the zoning. Um, but really it, it was an office space that we are completely renovating um, the interior of it. A lot of the, you know, the, the um, individual leaves, Individual rooms are available, so there's lots of smaller rooms for smaller programming. But we have to put we're putting in a, in a open concept kitchen, um, so that our members can smell the food cooking, you know, interact. We can also do baking and activities using activities of daily living, because we all know how important a kitchen is in in our lives. It's the new living room, right? Um, so mm-hmm. we want people, you know, our, our countertop is um, that they can witness everything happening. They can saddle up to the counter and come and chat um so you know we're, we're recreating that new living room kitchen experience um we're also putting in fully wheelchair accessible bathrooms and a complete fully accessible spa like bathroom so that you know our with uh, aromatherapy and uh, and the uh, chromotherapy the light therapy um tub so you know we can we can bathe um our members in a, a beautiful you know sensory stimulating environment um, so that our members and, and their families can get the help with, you know, the, the bathing that so many people and the hygiene that so many people need. So we're actually looking after the care needs. Um, so, yeah, that, the renovation and as well, you know, making it a, a beautiful environment. Um, so, you know, we're really prettying it up, you know, using interiors that um, are very home-like. Um, you know, no more jerry chairs sitting in the, you know, the rooms um, or, you know, the big, big ugly, you know, chairs that you often see in long-term care. We're using home mm-hmm. furnishing. Um, everything's practical, wipeable, of course, but, you know, it's, you know, leather seating and um, an environment that, you know, the wood floors and um, beautiful, you know, it, it's focusing on really making it a, a, a comfortable environment. Uh-huh. Well, that's uh, that's absolutely fantastic. Now, people can go to your um, <clears throat> can go to your website, and they can actually see a floor plan. And I think you've got a virtual tour um, there yes, as we do. well. Um, but one of the things that I really like when I'm when I'm looking at your floor plan here is, you know, it's not <clears throat> a lot of adult days are these big open spaces, and there's there's so much going on. And this really yep. looks like a like um, uh, so comfortable and so private, and is is it, it just seems so respectful the way it's laid out with 
you even have a movie theater, you've got a quiet time area, you've got a library, a music den, um, you've got a memory nursery. What Can you explain to us what a memory nursery is? Yeah, so it's the it's the use of doll therapy. Um, I know it sounds a lot of people, you know, they get it up in arms with the with the experience of doll therapy and making it, you know, giving a childlike kind of feel. But you know, I um, I had a hard time at first grasping the the doll therapy. Um, but you know, children are such a big part of our lives, and I myself have a three year old that's going to be coming in and spending some time here too. Um, so. It's uh you know the having a nursery here it it's often people with dementia they they enjoy having that interaction with dolls and and babies um you know feeding them caring for them it really brings a, a, an amazing calming effect and an interaction that um you know i i haven't witnessed with any other things similar so you know i thought you know and and that was you know that idea i i had seen at at sunrise um and you know i really liked it and we're just going to adapt it a little bit more um to make it you know a full scale nurseries that people can sit and you know and enjoy and reminisce about that you know our whole environment is based on reminiscing our experiences down to the pictures on our walls will be you know things that make it add to a reminiscing environment so that's uh, that's why we're we're having a nursery is just another center for our activities of daily living well, I I think that that is um, really really interesting. Now I have um, I have uh, Harry Urban on the line with us too, and he yeah. he actually is diagnosed with dementia. And I'd love to get his feedback and pull him into the conversation here. Um, Harry always has such great insights for us. Harry, are you there? I sure am. What do you What do you Hello, think Harry. about this? Uh, what do you think about this health health club concept? Uh, versus an adult day, just in title alone. Well, see, I I was I was concerned, well, not concerned. I, I was confused uh, actually when when I heard uh, uh, all time with health club. Now I visualized a huge room with rows and rows of of uh, treadmills and uh, and and bicycles and and things like that, and I thought. I don't know. I'm, I'm not. I'm not sure if if I would want to go to some place like that, or if I'd be able to go to some place like that. But then the more yeah. you explain to it um, what it is, then it. I I started to get a clearer picture of that. Yeah. And I think I think the concept is 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 super. Uh, I'd like to hear more about about the things that are done there. It, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, I mean, we have everything, yeah, and the reason why we went for that, the health club name is just because it seems like a more dignified name than, you know, the, the daycare kind of feel. We want to have an, definitely an adult-sounding thing, and health club looks at the overall health and happiness of people with Alzheimer's and related dementias. So, you know, it's it's not the treadmills and the, you know, the elliptical equipment. We do have exercise, mostly seated exercise, yoga calming exercises, low-impact exercises um, that we'll have available. Um, but we also have activities from, you know, playing pool to, you know, we have a, a large activity room to, you know, golfing and putting. We have, a, you know, we'll have a carpet space that, you know, they can do putting. We also have a music room. Music is as early, you know, as Lori said earlier on in the program, how important music therapy is. Music therapy, you know, if you've seen Alive Inside, is, is very, very important. So all our members will have access to iPads. Um, so we do have an iPad room that will each member will have their own set playlist, as well as their music, uh, their, their video, personal videos, and photos available to them. So families will say, you know, their particular music that they really enjoy that makes them happy. We will put them on our on our iPads, and all our staff have iPads on them as well, so we can do individualized care and information at the touch of our fingertips, um, so that we're always catering to the needs of our members. Um, the other areas we have um, we have quiet 
one-on-one rooms that our members can, you know, have more personal time. We know how important it is that, you know, people get the time and attention they need. So we're actually starting at a five-to-one staffing ratio because, you know, if, if people can't hear, be, feel heard and valued and respected and, you know, they keep getting pushed under the carpet because, you know, they may not be able to um, – express themselves as easily as, you know, the average person, that we need to be able to give them the time and attention that they need. So we have lots of smaller group programs so that every, you know, our many programs can be spontaneous instead of scheduling all the time. People with dementia have a hard time following a schedule. So we follow it based on how people want to be, uh, how they want their day to roll out. We also have lay-down rooms. I experienced a day program recently that, uh, and, you know, the, the people that came to the day program weren't allowed to close their eyes. They weren't allowed to rest. Well, people can be here for an 11 hours a day, and I can't imagine not wanting to, you know, take, close my eyes for a few minutes. So we give people the opportunity to, you know, rest up for, you know, an hour, have a, have a break if they want to, and then rejoin our programs. So it's giving the people the option at all times, the option to participate in our programs or not, or just enjoy the environment. Um, You know, we're offering lots of sensory stimulation, activities of daily living so people can, you know, feel like part of a community when they come to us rather than, you know, that they're just joining, you know, a set program and lining up them up in front of a TV. We have, you know, a movie theater that, you know, people can watch their favorite movies in a relaxing environment, lounges. So there's so much available for people to to choose and get invited and encouraged to attend. But if they choose not to, that's their prerogative. Now I, I, I wish love- I lived in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank it you. Really is a, is a very very nice concept. Um, to give people the freedom. I did put a link in the chat box, too, if people want to check out the floor plan, because I think once you see that, um, it just uh, is, It'll just become so much clearer in terms of how how things are are situated. You even have a potting room and a solarium, um, you yep. know, which is I, it's. I mean, there's so many different things. There's a there's a kind of a bar and a lounge area, um, hydrotherapy. Um, can you talk about hydrotherapy a little bit more? Yeah, so that's our spa-like bathroom. So people can go in and, you know, the, the people would book to have their, their bathing in the, in the spa-like an, environment. So um, it is a, it's a jetted tub that they can go in and have their, their, their nice, you know, aromatherapy, chromatherapy, you know, bath. And, you know, that's, that's an option. That, and as well, you know, we have a, a fully accessible shower. Um, so, you know, people can get, you know, the families can get the help that they need um, with hygiene and, and making sure that our members always look and feel good is so important, you know. That's one people the area that people with dementia struggle so much with is, you know, that they can't, you know, manage to, you know, get their hair right or they, you know, getting their makeup on for the day. We can help with that. You know, it, it, so long as, you know, people are feeling good and looking good, um, you know, it, it, so much more comes together that, you know, it, they're going home happy. Mm-hmm. Now, with um, because you have so many different rooms, um, it, yeah. and f- as, as far as supervising people, um, how will that yeah. work? Because I would imagine you're going to have different uh, people at different stages um, that will be yeah. coming. So h- yeah. how will that so the work? Way we- yeah, so the way we do is we variable staff based on our assessments. So we go out and we assess our members and see where they're at and how much staffing they require. Um, So we have three levels of care. Um, So if somebody, we start at basically a five to one ratio um, for our level one care. Um, So that's people that, you know, need the the safety, the security of our environment, reminders, you know, may need queuing for certain things, but, you know, they're not requiring the heavier care. To our third level of care, that's about a one to three ratio um, where, you know, they might need assistance with feeding, they might need incontinence support. Um, So 
that's where, you know, that's where we ensure that, you know, our staffing is always maintained so that there's people always around. Each staff gets assigned to each member um, so, our, so that our staff are always checking up, making sure that they're okay. But at the same time, we give them freedom to wander the space. The space is secure. Areas that they, you know, may put them in the harm's way will be locked um, so that our members can freely wander the space without, you know, having to worry that, you know, they're, they're going to get into anything that's, that's going to cause them, you know, uh, discomfort or harm. Um, so, you know, we're always having people wandering around making sure and, and checking that, you know, everybody's having a good time. Okay. Well, that, that makes complete sense. Um, what is your projection date for opening? I know you're still under construction right now. Yeah, we are, we're hitting the final bend for construction. So um, we're opening for tours mid-March, and we're planning to open on May the 4th. Okay. So yeah, um, very I exciting. can't imagine how excited you are with all of that. That's yes. got to just be, Yeah, dreams come oh. true. <laughs> uh-huh. Well, very, very neat. Now, can people um, get tours or talk to you ahead of time before it opens? Or Absolutely. People can register now if they'd like. Um, we are taking registration. Um, we also have online registration available as well. Um, so, you know, people can um, also just give me a call um, at uh, 905-888-8808 um, or go onto the Memory & Company website at memoryandcompany.com um, and uh, they can book a, book a tour for as soon as we're, we're open. It should be by mid-March. Um, we should be ready and have the place up and pretty um, for people to tour around. Um, so, yeah, just reach out to us if, uh, if you're interested in, in our health club. We'd love to have uh, love to have have them. Wow. Now, are you going to be doing anything with um, with volunteers in your community at all to assist with staffing, or is this going to be um, strictly staffed? Um, it, this will be curious. staffed, but, you know, volunteers are always welcome mm-hmm. to, you know, always add to our environment. We would never include them in our in our roster of, you know, our, our care our care needs. Um, but of course, adding adding more volunteers. Um, we've also reached out to different schools um, and colleges in the area for you know uh, students to come and and learn from our environment as well. So you know the the more people that are interested in joining, or um, you know I, I have I have already had you know art therapy students come out and want to join music. Students want to come and volunteer their time. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, we're welcoming anybody that, you know, wants to add uh, to the quality of our environment. Um, absolutely. The reason I ask is I know Harry's on a big mission with volunteers and stuff right now, and so I thought, well, I would I would pose that. He's been a, just a huge advocate and has done some really neat things uh, through social media and then um, also through memory cafes and stuff physically. Um, have you have you considered doing kind of a memory cafe type concept in your in your health club at all where um family members could also participate if it's just for an hour or two yeah, actually, that's funny. You said that we actually are. Our first original name was Memory Cafe, <laughs> and oh, really? then as we as we learned, it was, and we had to get it changed. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, we we are in. You know, that's something that we could look uh, look at down the road. And you know, as as our members are getting oriented to our program as well, we do welcome family uh, a family member to come and you know help help them through the transition because we all know you know the the change of environment. It can be, you know, very, very hard on people with dementia. So, you know, we we do welcome families, you know, at, at first to come in and, and help them get oriented, um, so that you know they're they're more and more comfortable until you know we can fully take over. But yeah, having families come in for you know a coffee and and you know really getting to know our environment is is good as well. Yeah. Yeah, I just thought in, in some ways it might be a, a neat thing because this. Um, it's just such a nice concept. You definitely would have um, the room to facilitate kind of an activity of that nature, yep. and it might and it might help build um, some support for family members as well um, with that, yeah. um, which is I think always always needed. Now, with your library and stuff, are you going to be stocking that independently, or are you looking for people to you know to donate things 
in the library. We would absolutely look to donate. We have been actually, um, the ladies at, uh, my mom works for University of Toronto. They have kindly donated many um, uh, coffee table books for us. Um, they, they're the Trinity College ladies of the library. Um, so they've donated quite a few, um, I think about 60 coffee, coffee table books. So any books that, you know, are uh, easily browsed through lots of pictures um, and, and as well as other, you know, a, a variety of other books as well. But, uh, yeah, absolutely, we would uh, love love any books or information that people want to donate or any, you know, uh, small programs or activities if they want to add to us. We, we're definitely looking at, you know, adding more to our quality as, you know, this business is started by strictly my husband and I, you know, where we actually sold our home to, uh, to start this company up and, you know, put everything that we had, that we had to, to get this company started because we really, really believed in making, you know, it was time for a change in the way, you know, dementia care is. Um, so, yeah, any, anything that people want to help out, that's, that would be fantastic. Okay, wonderful. Now, also, um, I would imagine that you'd be open to, like, audio books if people had audio books. Absolutely. And then um, with the music done, what, what what is that going to kind of look and feel like? Is that going to be more plugged into um, technology for music, or will there be um, different we'll types a, of Yeah, a little bit of yeah, so we'll have different types of instruments. Um, we have a we'll have a piano here. We have guitars. Um, we'll have a, a variety of different instruments available. Um, but also at the same time, um, you know, we're going to have iTunes available um, with a variety of different music there, as well as records and you know and and, uh, and record players. So it's whatever people are comfortable with, used to. Um, yeah, where we'll search, you know, any any different type of music that's that's available. Okay. One of the things, I don't know if you're familiar, I'll, I'll go ahead and give them a plug, but Alzheimer's Music Connect um, it has some yep. great mu- music with a patent pending, you know, and it's, it's something that people can just kind of plug into, but it helps them engage yep. longer, up to three hours longer, and I didn't know if you were familiar with them, but that might be something that you'd want to um, check out, because they've got a really nice variety of um, of songs, and, um, and then, you know, also I know a lot of people are interested in um you know um prayers or eulogies and things like that too uh, i know that there are companies yep. out there that that have that as well um it just uh I, I just i think this is just an absolutely brilliant brilliant concept um harry i'm going to go ahead and pull you back in again and see if you had any other comments that you wanted to wanted to ask ashley uh yeah i i, I do um I have a couple ideas for you, Ashley. Now I don't know if you have them have them in your plan or not, but you just said uh, uh, everybody has access to an iPad. Um, now, yeah. are you going to be are you going to be setting up so they can do video chats uh, for uh, the the long distance loved ones that uh, that uh, yep. I mean, we do, we will have FaceTime ability very hard. Yep, yep, we will have FaceTime ability. Um, we have a room full of five iPads that they can easily access at any time, um, as well as all our staff have iPads that they can utilize. Um, so, yeah, anything that, you know, they we can connect to or download, absolutely. Um, you know, if that's something that, you know, the individual is looking for or their family, we can for sure do that. I, I've seen so many people that uh, I set up a video chat with them, and they um now they're in their they're in the mid to late stages but yep. uh they 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 touch the screen of the iPad they even you know when the loved one comes on the iPad they even kiss the iPad i mean no. it's, it's 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 so heartwarming for me uh, another place we have around here they have a sewing room uh for the women that um yep. They they go there and they sew and they they knit whatever and you also have a um, a workshop room for the men and and this is a yeah. room where uh, they can go and uh, and they can have bird houses now everything is pre cut but they can sand it down they can nail it together and they can paint it themselves 
uh, they have a yeah. they have a music room with a jukebox, and the jukebox is is loaded with with uh, uh, songs of of the era that we're living in. Yeah, you know, like like, yeah, like I'm mean, living in the fifties and sixties, and that's the kind yep. of music I listen to. And and the jukebox yep. is set up like that. And uh, another thing I'm pushing is is a um, is a gardening room where people uh, people love to get their hands dirty. And uh, I make raised flower beds that somebody with a wheelchair can 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 come up to, and uh, it's like a a raised flower bed with dirt in it, maybe six eight inches deep, and they can plant tomato plants or whatever. You know, and yep. they get so much enjoyment by sitting around this this bed and just pulling out weeds and just tending to it every day. Yeah, and and that's you know uh, just on the and the garden notes. Um, that's why we we pick the space that we have. We have a beautiful. Um, beautiful space and we're actually going to have an outdoor lounge with some raised garden beds um, so that our, mm-hmm. our members can plant and, and be part of that. I know I love gardening and you know I would want that always to be part of my life that uh, that it's definitely something that uh, that we're, we are plan- that's in the plans. Um, as for sewing, absolutely. You know, my husband's a fantastic sewer. Um, that uh, we we would definitely uh, look into to adding something like that and, and the workshop space as well. Um, you know, we're we're constantly looking for ways, you know, to to improve our environment and you know, use innovation and you know what our members are interested in doing too. Um, to uh, to improve, you know, the the environment that we have. So, you know, often people ask me, you know, what what's your planned set of activity lists that you're you're going to be doing? I said, well, I don't have all my members yet. I don't know, you know, what they like. Why am I planning for them that, you know, we're doing bingo five days a week when nobody likes bingo? So, you know, it's it's looking at what each individual member wants to do here. We'll try to bring it here. So it's 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 getting it's getting that. Um, you know, looking at, you know, what they want. Very That's cool. That's so wonderful. I wish you the most success. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I am really looking forward to um, to your launch and to um, staying connected with this. Uh, like I told you offline, Ashley, I, I can see this being franchised. Um, I think it's really a brilliant, brilliant concept and one that so many people have talked about needing um, a different approach, uh, a dignified approach to uh, to respite care uh, for families yeah. and and for a, a fun um, place to yeah. be. And I and I love the I love the you know where you have the quiet room. So it's not about having to be busy all the time. It's about being. Um, thoughtfully and meaningfully engaged and we don't always want that 24/7 in our life we need some downtime. No, not at all. And, <laughs> yeah. and and um you know taking that into consideration one of my favorite um comments uh, Harry made one time on our dementia chats webinars was he said, you know, I used to like to relax before I got uh diagnosed. I still do and it's funny how we forget just that that simple and and so important statement that we all need to relax to rejuvenate um and it's okay to be quiet it's actually quite brilliant Absolutely. to be able to be comfortable um and quiet and um so I, it looks like you know again the floor plan looks amazing um with the big you know you've got indoor and outdoor areas um you've got the the fitness and dance studio um do you have um, any certain types of, of dance that you're thinking of doing? With people um, well, or? For, you know, we're, yeah, we've had a, a few dance schools reach out to us, you know, that we, we can do a, a couple, you know, classes, uh, you know, as well, you know, just, just fun dancing. Let's turn on the music yeah. and be silly. You know, that's that's one thing, you know, you don't always need the, you know, the formal dance training. You need, you know, a bunch of people just wanting to listen to fun music and, and be silly and, and dance and enjoy themselves. So, you know, it doesn't have to be so regimented. It can be, you know, a, a, just a fun type of place that, you know, they can they can just be themselves and, you know, enjoy. 
Yeah. Well, and music and dance is so powerful. It's great exercise. Mm-hmm. It lifts the spirits. I mean, it changes actually the body chemistry as a whole. Um, and if you can create that environment where it doesn't have to be perfect, it's not about being perfect. Um, you know, you're going to, as you know, you're going to get a lot more participation. People are going to have a lot more fun. Um, if they're yeah, not feeling yeah. like they're I know I'm not a good dancer, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, but I love too. to dance, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yep. Are you going to do anything? I, I'm just thinking um, along that whole music lines. Are you going to do any kind of karaoke type thing? Because I, I could see people being interested in that too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely karaoke. Uh, yeah, my mm-hmm. my husband's on the Asian, <laughs> is Asian and loves karaoke, and <laughs> so yeah, karaoke is definitely uh, going to be part of it. We already have a karaoke machine. Yep. Okay, okay, and I I know here in Minnesota they've um, started uh, Voices of Dementia, which is a choir, and um, has gotten um, actually quite a bit of press uh, internationally with it. It's been uh, pretty fabulous, and I know for my for my own mom who really liked to sing. Um, you know, even when she was in the nursing home, she would say she was in the choir and she'd go around and sing to others. But it's um, uh, you know something like that too. I think is a is a fun activity and it also gives back um to other people you know for enjoyment and stuff too but it sounds like you have such a good handle on a variety um that you're going to be offering and um you know you do have one one space in your floor plan um that doesn't mm-hmm. have a name in between the the potting room and, and solarium and the kitchen um, what is that area going to be? It looks like it leads to the outdoors, too. Do you know offhand? Oh, the, I'm trying to picture where you're talking about. Um, I, the there, potting room leads to the outdoor space, um, so yeah. I'm not sure. And then we have an activity room, the whole thing. Oh, you know what? You're probably the open concept laundry. Is that? Oh, okay. Because there's yeah. cause there is. There is the laundry room and the spa. I see that. But this yeah. is like in, okay. in between where the kitchen is and the potting room. And so, and it's behind kind of the movie theaters and the locker room. And there's like three. Oh, I think that's just a hallway. Oh, oh you know what? That, that's just our mechanical room. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Cause there's, it, it yeah, looks, and storage. Looks, like it's, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. That yeah, we need lots of storage to put all our goodies in. Okay. Cause, and then there's like three smaller rooms that are kind of the size of the yep. laundry and the spa room. Are, what are those yep. areas? That those. Yeah, so they're just individual program rooms. So, you know, we can do puzzles or we can, you know, just giving space so that, you know, we can do a reading stories or, you know, just, just private okay. one-on-one kind of space or small group space. Oh, okay. Oh, that's nice. That's nice to have. You really um, ha- have thought this out really, really well, and um, I-, I just uh, I think it'll be exciting. Are you going to do an actual virtual tour? You know, once you're up and running. I know right now you have a virtual tour, kind of a you know an architect virtual tour. Posted. Yes. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Um, as soon as we have it up and, and ready, we will have it uh, photographed and put it right up. And uh, right now we're just looking at the, um, the options of you know, getting the 360 virtual tours done as well um, so that you know, we, you, people can get a, a full scene of the place without even having to come in. Okay, wonderful. Well, anything that we didn't cover that, um, that you're interested in sharing with people? Um, I, I think we we covered the majority, but uh, we're just I'm I'm super excited to you know make a make a change and hopefully we we set a new standard of you know what what day programs should be like and you know that you know it's individualized and and giving you know the dignity and and respect that people with dementia so deserve and the fun they deserve you know it's no longer you know it should be acceptable to have people lined up in in front of a TV and and that's how their day is people need with dementia need to have socialization and stimulation and and friendships and relationships um you know relationships are such a valuable part that regardless of of the stage of disease that you're in i mean i've seen people even form you know more intimate relationships and in, in with dementia that you know it's just because you have dementia doesn't mean your life is over it, it just means you have to live it differently Mm-hmm. Exactly, Harry. Any any comments? 
I am very impressed. Uh, I wish you the best of luck, and I hope this I hope this concept grows and grows, so it comes down into the United States because I think it's I think it's a wonderful idea. I hope so yeah. too. <laughs> Thank you so much, Terry. I agree. And then um, Ashley, you, do you want to give people your contact information one more time? Sure. Yep. Um, we are. Um, our website is www.memoryandcompany.com, as it sounds. Um, and our number here is nine zero five eight 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 zero eight. Okay. And I, I'm just going to make mention that um, and is spelled out and company is, is spelled out. So memoryandcompany.com. Yes. And and um I and I had a hard time finding it. Uh, uh, when I searched, uh, I don't know, my computer did an update and it was searching by Yahoo, and I couldn't find it. But when I when I searched by Google, it popped up right away, um, and was easy yeah. to find. So I just want to make sure that people find you okay because again, fabulous concept, so exciting to hear and to to see your dream coming um, through after 17 years of hard work and. Um, you know, not too many people are willing to sell their house to see their dream come true. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> I know I'm crazy. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it really it shows your commitment and your belief, and I think because of that, um, I, I think you're going to be rewarded really well. I think this is way overdue um, and is 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 needed and has been asked for um, by so many people, and it's just. It's nice to see when someone's brave enough to take the risk, uh, yeah, to make the change. So thank you so well, much, thank Lori. Thank you, thank you, and um, please keep me posted um, as you as you go along. And everyone, keep in mind May fourth. Um, and if you want to send me like a press release or something when you when you open up, please do so, and I'll I'll push that out Absolutely. on the blog and stuff too. Okay. okay? Okay, thank Sounds you so great. much for spending time with us today. Really appreciate it very much. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you so much for having me. Have a great day. You too. Well, I'm looking outside of my window here in Minnesota, and we are finally are getting some snow, and it looks like we're going to get quite quite the bit <laughs> today. I, I don't think we're going to be able to compare to, to out east there. How are you doing snow-wise, Harry? You want some? <laughs> Do you want? <laughs> uh, we have we have en- we have enough ground here to ship out to you. Actually, in Pennsylvania, it's it's not bad because all the major storms that came through um, missed us, either to the north, to the south, or whatever. But as you go more east, um, they've been. I mean, some places got like two and a half foot of snow in one day. You know, I can't imagine. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that Boston really, really got nailed, and I saw that they're melting. They're trying to melt it, and they can't keep up with it and and stuff. And we're here in the Twin Cities. We're only supposed to get two to four inches, but at least it'll cover the ground because we've actually been able to see the grass, which has been very strange. But it's supposed to be kind of blizzardy, and it was sleeting a little bit earlier. So, yeah, big Big change here for us. Well, I'm going to go roll into our um, kind of mid-program highlights here, and then I will introduce and kind of set up our our second half of the show, um, which I'm, again, very excited. We're going to be talking about um, fit kits. Um, and we've got a couple of just uh, excellent, excellent guests that are going to tell us all about that. Um, But in the meantime... Um, If you weren't able to listen to our last radio show, um, we talked about dementia. We're in this together with Mike Good, and um, it was an interesting conversation. We had uh, a few people that had called in and asked questions as well. Our next radio show, uh, next Tuesday on the 17th, we're going to be talking with author Carrie Mills, uh, who wrote the book I Care. And on the 24th, we're going to be doing a two-hour special on frontal temporal uh, lobe dementia. And so I would encourage people to be part of that show. We're going to have a a wide variety of of people um, as guests that we're going to be talking to. But again, we always encourage the general public um, to, to partake in those conversations as well. 
Uh, later this afternoon, we are going to be having one of our Dementia Chats webinars. That starts at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 2 Central, 1 if you're Mountain Time, and uh, noon if you're uh, Pacific Time. And those are free. You can just go to the website, alzheimerspeaks.com. Um, or you can go to our Dementia Chats page um, on Facebook. Um, it's posted all over to our blog post uh, to get the link uh, to be able to go in. Our prior Dementia Chats, we talked about advocacy and the needs for volunteers and the needs for businesses and communities to really educate and organize working with volunteers. We know that um, there's kind of a big stigma about liability um, with volunteers, and so we had an interesting conversation on that. We also talked with uh, Michael Ellenbogen and Harry Urban, who is with us today, and Robert Bowles about their current and future projects. Um, all three of these men are living with dementia and doing it brilliantly and really raising the bar in terms of of how you can live and, and what you can what you can do with your life um, as a whole. And so our conversations there are always very fun. They're very informal, just, just like uh, they are here on uh, Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. Uh, very informal. Um, there are no questions, a dumb one. And uh, we love to hear everyone's voice. I have on the blog um, a couple of... Um, blog post I'm just going to mention. Uh, on the 8th, I did a post. Uh, again, Michael Ellenbogen had gone and seen the movie Still Alice, and he did a little review on that. And Michael, again, is living with dementia. I had not seen it, um, but his review prompted me to get my butt in the car and drive across town to the only theater around us that was hosting it. And I was so glad that I went and saw that movie. Harry, have you seen uh, Still Alice? I have not seen it yet, no. Yeah, it's really done uh, very well. And, um, you know, there's only so much they can do within their time frame. But um, I think they did a nice job. I, I, I'm i saddened that it's not in more theaters because so many people want to see it. And it's very limited. Um, it will be going um, out on, on Netflix, that is my understanding, soon. But it's too bad that they lost that opportunity um, not realizing that the general public really is ready to see movies like this. And, um, you know, maybe the next one they'll actually book to be in the theaters and not just have these little specialty things, uh, especially with the awards uh, that that this one won. So, um, but it was, it was a very interesting. I was, I was saddened too when I went to the theater that there weren't more people there um, because again, not, not everybody knows and, and people aren't used to hounding a theater for a movie. And that seems to be what we have to do for any dementia related um, movies is we have to hound them to say that we want it. So I encourage people to pick up your phone and, and call your local theaters and kind of chew them out. Let them know um, you're ready, you're willing, and able to pay for, for that type of movie and that it's needed and um, that it will do some social good as well as uh, just pulling in funds to the theater. On the 8th, we also uh, uh, I also posted a poem called Tram in Nowhere, and that was by a, a gal from Melbourne, Australia, who submitted that, and we've gotten some nice feedback on on her poem, so I'd encourage you to go read that. I also put a save the date um, for a free caring for a person with memory loss conference. It's going to be held Saturday, May 30th, uh, 2015, from 8 to 4.30 p.m. at the Mayo Memorial uh, Auditorium at the University of Minnesota. Uh, it's put on by Joe Gogler every year, and it's it's really a nice uh, a nice conference. Uh, that he he puts on, so you can get more information there. And then I also posted um, a link on the fifth. Um, host uh, Ken Capron uh, from Memory Works does a monthly speakers forum, and on uh, this one he was talking about the stigma of dementia, and he actually interviewed Michael Allen Bogan and myself, and so we had that. Uh, participated in that but that is um videoed and people can uh can get more information on that show as well 
So let me go ahead and introduce our our next guest here. Um, again, very excited about um, who we've who we've got with us today. Um, uh, if you missed the first half of the show, I would recommend that you um, go back and listen to it. Uh, we were talking about the health club concept for people with dementia, which is a an adult day, definitely with a twist, um, called Memory and Company. It's kicking off in Canada um, by a young woman by uh, named Ashley Kwan, and um, I think just a brilliant, brilliant concept. Our, our second half of our show today, we are going to be talking with Karen Love and Kelly Sheets, uh, who are both with um, Fit Kits. And Karen is a former speech therapist and long-term administrator with more than 30 years of experience of um, Oper, uh, oper, uh, I can't talk here. I'm losing my word. Operational um, experience in advancing person-centered practices in long-term services and support center, uh, settings. She is really innovative in her approach, and she's nationally recognized, um, and she has used some Montessori-based techniques that enhance the well-being um, of people living with dementia through meaningful and purposeful engagement. Um, and she is the co-founder of Fit Kits, which is a dementia engagement product um, that is researched and it's tested and it is developed with the mission of helping people living with dementia be able to live more fully. So welcome, Karen. How are you today? I am terrific. Good morning. And it sounds like Minnesota is cold this time of year. <laughs> it is. It's It's been unusually warm, but as I'm looking out my window, it's blowing to beat the band and just looking kind of nasty out there. So I'm kind of glad I'm in all day today. <laughs> so, yeah. But we're we're due. We are Minnesota. We are supposed to have snow and cold, um, and so we've been actually really kind of blessed so far this year. But I think today today we will remember this one. <laughs> um, let let me go ahead and um, introduce Kelly, your cohort here. Uh, Kelly started her work with elders as a recreational therapist in an acute uh, rehabilitation center, and she quickly moved into management and marketing of assisted living communities. After 10 years, she began consulting and um, working to increase the quality of life uh, for for elders. Her passion for helping people who are living with dementia and their families um, has really um, grown, and as a result, um, she started working with Fit Kits as well. So welcome, Kelly. How are you today? I'm great. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm glad to well, be here. Well, good. I'm gonna. What we're gonna do here is I'm gonna kind of post some questions back and forth here, and I think I'm gonna throw the first one out to Karen since she's one of the the co-founders of um, Fit Kits. Um, Karen, what what made you decide to start this company? Well, a, a host of things, but um, basically through my work in the field and helping people live more fully with dementia when I was running different long-term care environments and then um, subsequently doing research, a number of projects that were funded by the National Institute on Aging and uh, the Administration on Aging and realizing, you know, that it's it's pretty easy to do, um, you know, this uh, interaction um, and, you know, basically bringing out the best in people living with dementia, helping them engage something that their brains no longer automatically give them the capacity to do. And and my um, research partner, Elia uh, Famia, and I saying, wow, why limit this? I mean, this needs to get out there so that other people can realize um, and and put this together themselves. And with Valentine's Day around the corner, the timing for this is perfect uh, because <laughs> engaging somebody to help them live fully with dementia is truly an act of love. Definitely, definitely is. Um, can you tell? Can you tell us, Karen, um, what 
does living fully with dementia really mean to you? How would you define that? Sure. And you may be hearing, people may be hearing a lot of things on um, uh, shows and news, reading in newspapers about the neuroscience of romance and love. Well, there's an awful lot in common with the neuroscience of living fully with dementia. Because what happens with um, the romance is that these warm, exciting sparks that cause one's heart to flutter is the brain's limbic system releasing what are known as feel-good neuro neurotransmitters like oxytocin and dopamine. Well, that's the same thing that happens when we can help people live fully with dementia. Uh, their brains no longer, um, after a certain point, um, allow them to have the executive function of finding interesting, purposeful, meaningful things to do. And so they end up spending long periods of time um, inactive and bored, which which leads to feelings of agitation, frustration, sadness. Um, but if you can help engage them uh, very similarly, it sparks these feel-good neuro uh, transmitters, which um, you know then uh, produce the feel-good feelings, as opposed to the opposite when they're not sparked and you and people start feeling agitated. Um, frustrated, um, sad, the brain will spark a different type of neurotransmitter, such as um, uh, norepinephrine, um, cortisol, and adrenaline. So the brain's going to start sparking neurochemicals, one way, transmitter chemicals, one way or the other. We might as well help ensure that the ones that sparked are proactive and positive ones. Wonderful. Kelly, anything you want to add to, um, you know, I guess your definition of living fully with dementia? Absolutely. Um, I really, um, I was telling Karen earlier that I love that definition of how someone lives fully is this idea of triggering the good, happy chemicals for someone so that they can actually feel really good. And I think one of the things that I've seen over the years is that most people just don't know that that is possible, that they don't realize that there's this next level that someone with dementia can go to. But it's this place that we just make assumptions that, you know, that it's part of the disease process, that we don't, we don't engage any longer once we have dementia. Someone's just not interested. But when a family or a friend or a professional realizes, oh, part of this is me, doing something to help trigger that interaction in the brain and then they can engage, It's I think that's taking it to the next level. And like what I think of and maybe some of the listeners can think of is that um, I like to give my own example of how I feel in my body. It's like if I'm sitting through, say, a long conference all day long and I'm sitting there not doing anything, my body starts to feel like, almost depressed, like, oh, my gosh, I don't feel very good. I don't feel like I want to do anything. I might even feel irritated and agitated in my body, like, get me out of here. But as soon as I get up, I start moving, someone starts talking to me about something interesting, it's almost like the chemicals in my body change and I become enlivened again. And I think that's kind of that relation for the chemical that Karen's talking about is, like, when we are that trigger for the person, they can actually turn on and re-engage with us. So that's that mm -hmm. place where it's just rather going from living to living more fully, I think. So okay. that's I, my I image like of it. A, oh, go a ahead, great Karen. example is, is um, uh, the gentleman that were, um, you know, talking earlier, Michael Ellenbogen and the others, is that, um, you know, they are able at this stage to fully engage themselves and, you know, are very active and doing wonderful things. Um, so clearly they're, they're the kind of individuals that um, that kind of level of engagement is going to be so powerful and important for them later on. So it's good to know that. Um, and then their loved ones and um, others in their world, um, when they no longer can manage the executive function of finding and instigating um, and self-initiating those things, that others will do that for them. Mm -hmm. 
Definitely. Now, one thing I didn't ask you to, and I probably should, and I'll, I'll throw it to Karen first, is, Karen, have you been personally touched by, you know, with a, a friend or family member with dementia at all? I think people are always interested, how did you fall into this space? Sure. Well, um, yes, the answer is yes. My father had Alzheimer's disease, and he's been gone now for a um, little over 10 years. But I actually fell into the space as a senior in high school. I worked as a nursing home assistant on the 3 to 9 shift, and I just fell in love. I mean, I, I loved the elders overall. But the ones that just captured my heart especially were the individuals living with dementia. And um, I think it was twofold. One, um, you know, when when you, as Kelly was talking, um, when you have this relationship and, and you connect with another, there was this light that would just go on in their eyes. And, you know, I realized that there was, you know, so much more going on inside that, you know, others weren't. Um, recognizing or registering, and, um, oh, we did all kinds of things. I mean, back in the day, unfortunately, it was a long time ago since I was a senior in high school, but, um, but you know, they used to keep those kinds of residents um, in bed and, you know, wouldn't even necessarily um, help them get up and dressed. And, you know, that was one of the things is, oh, no, let's get up. And, um, you know, what, what do you want to do? Oh, I want to eat chocolate. Um, well, let's let's figure out how how to get you some chocolate, and um, you know to to see that interest and excitement, and um, uh, what literally I maybe talk just a little bit about the physiology um, of what's sparking. So the neurosynapse, neural synapses in the brain, um, you know some of those with um, the different kinds of dementia. Um, you know, those cells, many of those cells die away. And so the connections don't automatically happen. But when you get this um, activity through the neurotransmitter, through the chemicals, they spark. And um, basically that's what neuroplasticity is all about. It's sparking new neural connections to make things happen. And so, um for example, you, I don't know if you're familiar with the movie, um, I remember better when I paint. For somebody for whom painting was really important, it sparks that, um, you know, interest. There's an advocate that I'm working with that lives in Florida right now, and when he starts talking about advocacy and you could just imagine his brain just lighting up like crazy, he doesn't have um, the same amount of difficulty um, putting things together and losing his place because his brain is firing away, um, you know, which is really exciting. But, yes, my dad had um, had Alzheimer's disease, and so I do have that one personal experience as well. Okay. How how about you, Kelly? Have you been personally touched? Um, yes. Well, to be honest, in my immediate family, my grandfather had dementia, which was triggered by um, he had a stroke and unfortunately didn't live very long after that. But on what I consider my personal, I moved from the East Coast to the West Coast right out of um, college. And so my family are my friends now on the West Coast. And I was actually the executive director of a community in Santa Barbara. And there were 100 residents that lived there, 100 amazing quote-unquote, independent seniors, and they had very limited income. So many of them were um, in the probably the beginning to moderate stages of dementia, and they were still living there with us, and we were doing everything we could to help them stay in their homes. And, and it was really great because I lived there. I lived there for four years with them, and so they were my friends and they were my personal experience. I'd meet them in the hallways after hours and talk to them and eat with them and live with them, and um, that was a huge impact on me to watch how when there was this expectation that we would continue to engage with them no matter what level of dementia they were living at, whether they had no dementia, they had some sort of dementia, um, that they really did function within a community quite well. Um, and to see them, you know, that difference when someone has moved into a community where the, everyone has dementia, I think it's a, a shift. It's interesting. So, yes, I did live um, with many people who had dementia, and it was a really fantastic experience. So, oh, 
Okay. Yeah. Great. Well, that's always just nice, I think, for our, for our listeners to know on that. Um, Karen, can you tell us a little bit um, more about um, fit kits? What, what exactly are there? Is there just one type of fit kit, or is there a variety of fit kits? What, what exactly is fit kits? <laughs> well, fit, uh, I, I probably ought to back up and explain that fit, F-I-T, um, isn't really the, the physical fitness. It really it stands for families slash friends interacting together. So that was um, you know really a nod to the Im- importance and recognition of the connection and relationships. And um, what we found through all of our um, extensive research um, in the field and working with hundreds of people living with dementia as well as um, family and other care partners was that people needed to have a little bit of information about how to trigger engagement. Every once in a while you'd find someone who intuitively knew how to do that. And, and Kelly was one of those intuitive kind of people. She just knew how how to engage people and how to figure out what it is that they like, but the majority of people don't know how to do that, or they they don't stop and think um, that somebody may be a morning person, and um, you know if you're trying to get them engaged in something late in the day, it's not going to be as um, effective. Or, for example, somebody who may be more um, artsy uh, inclined, you know, probably isn't going to get all that excited with um, maybe building materials. So, you know, you've got to start with some levels of, you know, what people like. So the kits, uh, we have 10 different kits, and they're um, thematic because there are lots of different interests for people, such as, um, you know, relaxation, art and design, sports, music, travel, et cetera. And then there's three different items in each of the kits because not everything will be interesting at any given time. Um, Something might be interesting one day, not the next day. All the items have been extensively tested, so they are items that have wide appeal. In other words, part of what um, we test and filter through in our fidelity testing is, is this interesting to lots of people? It might be interesting to one or two, but if it's not interesting to 20, 30, or 40, then that's an item we don't include um, in the kit. The kits also come with this um, general information, not too much because people don't want to read through a lot of material, but you know, what are the things to make the engagement um, successful, such as a good time of day and positive encouragement, um, also, introducing it's it's introducing an activity with enthusiasm. It's it's interesting how often somebody will just pull the material out and just set it on the table and you know practically walk away or you know just say here here do this. Um, and you know we need to spark and catalyze the engagement. And so the look on your face, the enjoyment. Um, you know, the fact that it's interesting, all of those are, are really critical, critically important. Um, can I give an example or two? Uh, that'd be great. How, that would be wonderful. Okay, super. So um, one of the families uh, that we worked with, the mother um, who was living with dementia, um, she was in her early 90s at this stage, and her daughter, she had been a choral arts director, and her daughter knew what kind of things um, would attract her mom or be of interest to her mom, um, but also knew how important it was for her to be um, enthused about, you know, the item. And so she would try things with her mother that were maybe a bit outside the box that people might not think would be a good um you know, thing to offer, but it was because of her enthusiasm and interest in the item that it was contagious. So, for example, um, you know, I'm set, her mother's in her 90s at this point, and she introduced garage some garage band music. So that's not music, you know, that the mother was typically familiar with or, or might even... Oh, Karen, are you there? 
Oh, no, we lost, we lost her. She, yep, her call got dropped. So, Karen, if you can call back in, that would be wonderful. And, Kelly, I don't know if you know um, the rest of that story at all, if you could pick that up or not. Well, I could just tell you that I've actually seen videos. They videotaped this family. So I've seen um, her mother really engaging in technology, using technology to trigger engagement between both of them. So that was kind of the result of that, something they didn't think would work. Um, But I kind of want to add on is that, you know, the fit kits, um, what makes them so, what made them really interesting to me was that, Um, This isn't just about engaging the person who's living with dementia and helping them live more fully, but this is a, as anyone that has someone in their life who's living with dementia knows, it affects all of us. It affects our relationships with one another. You know, if your mother has it or your family member, it also affects our neighbors and our extended friends when we are trying to interact with them. I mean, people lose their friends over this because people don't know how to interact. They don't know what to say. And I think the great thing about the fit kits is, Yes, they're, they're research and tested, which is brilliant because you know that you're getting something that's already been tried out and that there's kind of this, you know, if you, if you use this, you know, you can get these results. But the other part of that is that for the person that doesn't have dementia, it gives us a way to reconnect with someone. It gives us that feeling as well that, you know, that it triggers that feeling in us that, yes, I'm actually having, I'm creating new memories with my mother or my grandmother or my neighbor, and I'm still having that interaction. So I get to, um, I feel like I want to do that more often. And so as we have successes and that person who's living with dementia has successes, I think it really creates that connection between us that we start to lose if we feel like we're on different planes from them. We're not really... We're not really equal anymore. And I think that, for me, that's the biggest benefit of those kits is that it, you know, you get the directions in there. It gives you multiple ways to use them. It, it reminds you how to trigger that engagement so you both have those those connections. And the example that she was giving, I think that's what it's showing is that both the daughter and the mother were enjoying that. They were both having fun, and, and it makes it more rewarding and enjoyable for the future, mm-hmm. too. So Great. Oh, well, thank yeah. you, Kelly. We we do have Karen back here. I don't, oh, good. Yes, my phone just turned off. I so apologize. <laughs> nope, not a problem. That stuff happens. That's why you just dial back in. So Kelly just kind of uh, filled us in. And I think that that's one of the really important things, too, with um, engagement and activities is it's, it's not one-sided. It truly is about um both parties engaging and enjoying um, and having a pleasant time, you know, together. Right. And uh, and I think for a lot of people, and, and I might be wrong, but I think a lot of people are surprised that they can have fun um, mm-hmm. and that they can that they can really connect. Um, and it's so sad because I I think as a society we have been taught to give up on these people and let them go, you know, right. and. Oh. Um, you are so, so right. Um, I received um, an email. One of the kits that we have, um, our animal book, our animal kit, we wrote a book called Fur and Feathers. And um, I heard from a granddaughter, if I could read her email, it's short. It says, sure. looking at the fur and feathers photo book was such a great way to connect with my grandmother who has dementia. Since I live across the country from her, it's been almost two years since I last visited, and I was really nervous that I wouldn't know what to say or do around her. The book helped to lessen my awkwardness, and we found ourselves laughing and talking about the animals in the pictures. While looking at the book, my grandmother began to sing some songs about animals that my aunt who was also visiting with me, hadn't remembered hearing since childhood. The book helped break the ice and turned our visit into a very sacred and special time together. So this really speaks to what you were saying, um, Lori, and that is the the surprise, you know, that you can have Mm -hmm. these interactive and um, fun things together. Um, the, the The granddaughter, though, you know, and the aunt had to kind of go with the flow. And, you know, the the grandmother started singing these, um, you know, old songs. It sounds like, you know, they just got right into it. 
I can remember one time um, when my father was fairly advanced with dementia. My daughters were pretty young and um, loved going to feed the ducks, and we would save the um, ends of uh, the heels of bread and let them get nice and um, stale and uh, take them out for the ducks. And there we are, and the girls are feeding the ducks, um, you know, the bread, throwing it in, and we look over, and there's my dad eating um, the snail pieces <laughs> of bread. And, and my daughters started laughing because they went with the flow. You know, they didn't they, they didn't run over and say, no, Grandpa, you, you know, give them to the ducks. Um, but they just sort of went in the flow. And, and that's really important. It's like what this granddaughter just did, that, you know, as long as you have sort of a no wrong way, um, you know, that's, that's really nice. Um, I remember working with a family a number of years ago, and the um, uh, woman's husband was living with dementia, and he was very angry. And um, apparently in their relationship, he had never really cussed. But in this point of his life, he was very frustrated and was cussing up a storm. And one day, so we were, you know, kind of um, – training and teaching her, you know, some new skills. And, um, you know, one of them was to, um, you know, tickle his funny bone, you know, try and see if she can turn him around. Um, and so one day he, he yelled at her, go to hell. And um, <laughs> she she popped back and looked at him and said, not today. I'm really way too busy. <laughs> and and she, I wasn't there when this happened, but she described it and said, Oh my gosh! It tickled my funny bone. It just made me break out and laugh, laughter. And I looked up, and my husband—he was laughing. And a very difficult time transitioned, you know, to one in which we both connected and laughed. And she said, and it changed his whole outlook for that afternoon. And what that experience did was it let me realize that he was picking up on my anxiety, my frustration, reading it from my body language and that you know as I started to relax and smile and do more fun things and just look up and smile at him you know at times throughout the day it changed the entire dynamic and you know Lori if I could just oh go ahead I was going to say something that just what triggered me while Karen was talking was this thing where you know, when we have to move one of our loved ones into a community where they're going to be cared for. And I think that um, as listeners on your call today that maybe they're thinking, you know, also what they can personally do to engage someone, you know, their loved one with dementia. But also when I think when you go into a care home, the caregivers, the care partners there are so in the mindset of, I have to, quote, unquote, care for this person. So they're thinking tasks, activities of daily living, right, feeding, bathing, moving, all of these things. But I think having permission from the family is really important, that connection between the family member to also the caregivers to understand that it's okay for that person in the home when the family's not there to also have these engagements. And um, as we've started to talk to long-term care communities about using the fit kits there, I think that is part of that key as well is that the shifting culture around the fact that, you know, just be, we're paying you to care for my family member, but that also part of that is that you engage and love and laugh with them and that your job is to trigger them as well. So when family goes in to actually, sometimes it may require actually having that conversation like, hey, I want you to have a relationship with my father, and I want you to laugh with him and engage with him. And even taking items into the home with um, you on that visit to say, hey, why don't you try this? Because I think that's also the connection of, like, through the transition from someone living with you, and then if at some point they need to move somewhere, how can we keep that engagement and that connection and familiarity happening so that those things, you know, we do keep... uh, you know, efforting to have them be living fully and that there's not like this end date and then they go live somewhere and no one knows what they need on that level anymore. It's, but I think it's really engaging the caregivers as well in that process. Agree. Agree. I, I, oh, go ahead, Karen. Well, I was going to say that there's a lot of research about this and 
the dynamic of what happens. And um, when I was telling the story about the the woman who who responded to her husband's go to hell with, um, you know, sort of a funny response, um, it. Stephen Sabat is a neuropsychologist from Georgetown University, and he has been studying and working with families in this particular area for um, almost 40 years. And one of the things that he, he's the first one I've ever heard kind of be very forthright and connect the dots on this, but he says that a lot of times the way somebody experiences and reacts who's living with dementia is how they're treated, that we don't even realize sometimes that, you know, maybe we we aren't smiling or that we appear tense and, um, you know, sort of maybe anxious ourselves, and that really has, you know, very much of an effect, um, you know, for the other. So, a, a very important to think about, you know, how how we're feeling and how we're projecting. And Kelly, I loved your example of when um, you were running the assisted living. That it's very easy to get focused on all of the tasks uh, and helping the individual with just the daily parts of um, life. But we don't think about neglect. I mean, if those things weren't done, that would be physical neglect. But we don't think as a society about neglecting the spirit. And and really, that's the other side of not engaging somebody with dementia, is that the brain no longer can self-initiate. And so we end up trapping them with long days of doing nothing, which is really neglect of the spirit. And I don't know if any of you have been in um, a nursing home, but it can be really sad when you see people lined up in the corridors, um, you know, just sitting or around the nurse's station. And, you know, to me, that is a major signpost of neglect of the spirit that when you see that, right away that should trigger in us. Um, those individuals don't want to just be sitting out there. They're, they're doing so because they aren't being engaged. They don't have something to do. And if they're nodding off in their chair, it, it means that, you know, that if they're tired, they should be laid um, you know, and, and be more comfortable laying down in their bed. Um, so, so hopefully our work and um, some of our presentations and exhibits with fit kids, we're hoping to sort of start changing the conversation, changing the expectation of what it's like to live with dementia, and for others, you know. And I love that this is around Valentine's Day because um, it is an act of um, care, compassion, and love for others that we nurture their spirit as well as their physical needs. And if I can just say, Lori, that, that um, Karen, I, I love that. That's such a great perspective. And um, one of the things that uh, we all have to realize, Karen and I were talking before this conversation, and um, we were talking about families and people uh, that she's worked with that have said, oh, I, should, I just didn't put that together. I didn't know that. And I think part of it is that not a lot of people do know this. This isn't this isn't really common knowledge that, you know, all professionals know that, it, you know, we need to trigger people who have um, moderate to advanced dementia to get them engaged. You know, there's an assumption that, well, I put the activity in front of them, I put their art supplies in front of them, and then they didn't do anything, so they're not, that's just not in their interest, the realm of interest anymore. And, but it's just because most people don't know this, and that's why starting the conversation, you know, having the kits and the tip cards, and um, as well, Karen and her partner, Elia, they wrote um, a book. Their latest product is actually a guide and a DVD, and it's about, you know, that you can help someone live fully with dementia. And it's, it's a booklet that just gives you 
the basics of this engagement. You know, how do you help someone engage in a, in a family gathering or a group setting? How do you um, communicate with them in the most effective ways? Just so that this does become more common, so that people aren't saying, oh, I should have known that. And it's like, no, you just don't know because it hasn't really been out there in in the you know in front of everyone yet. So that's part of you know the research and everything that Karen and these other professionals have been doing is to get that out there, um, that it's not that you should have known this already. And that's something I would hate for a family to think because I didn't know this and I worked for years with people who live with, with dementia and I wasn't having these conversations until Karen connected me with all this research and made me realize that, like, oh, yeah, that's why that, what I did worked or sometimes it didn't work. So it's really about, you know, just having more resources. But anyway, this new book is a, it's a short little guide, and it's really helpful because that's what she's addressing. It's just the basics for anyone that wants to read about it, not the extensive research, so you have to know all the details, but just how you can do it. So just wanted to throw that in there. <laughs> okay. No, that's great. Good information. <laughs> Karen, did you want to add something to that? Well, yeah, just thank you. Um, but, no, one of the things that Kelly was saying about um, art, I was – Working with a, a daughter, a family member yesterday, whose mother um, had been a watercolorist and um, uh, uh, oil art or oil painter, and um, the daughter was explaining how frustrated that she and her brother and sister were because they brought all this stuff into her mom's assisted living, and her mom was ignoring it. And I just smiled because for some people, they might you know, that might trigger and, you know, they might be interested. But for others, they, they may have moved beyond the ability to manage things that way but still have artistic expression. And so um, there's a, a wonderful Mindware is a company, and they have uh, this wonderful wooden um, patterns that you can make all kinds of different designs called pattern play. And sometimes you, you have to spark you know, the interest through a little bit different modality. So in that case, you know, it wouldn't be painting herself, but maybe expressing, you know, that artistic um, ability in another way. Other, the, the opposite of that is sometimes families think, oh, they, they can't or won't, you know, that, that's not going to be of interest or something they can do anymore and um, can be very surprised. For example, um, one time in um, a, a nursing home, we got a resident uh, because he had been turned down and turned away from uh, a number of other places because he was um, what they called very difficult. Um, he wasn't difficult. He was just very bored. And um, you know, when we were talking with the family and getting some information about his background and what he used to like and what he did, and it turned out he was a trumpet player. And um, so I looked at the family and said, well, can you bring his trumpet in? And they looked at me and said, well, no, he, he doesn't play trumpet anymore. And I said, well, he may not play, but it might give him a sense of comfort just to see his trumpet. If he played that much, you know, in life, it may feel, um, you know, funny not having it around. And so they brought it in, and lo and behold, he picked that thing up, puckered his lips, and started blowing away. And... Um, the joy in their face to see, because they just kept thinking that, you know, their dad was, they'd lost him, that, you know, there weren't parts of him still there. And that's so not true. There, there are parts still there. It's just, you know, how do we access? How do we bring them out? How do we help, um, you know, spark that? And um, they walked away that day with tears in their eyes, and they said, thank you. We had no idea. And, it, it, again, that was another turning point for a family, um, you know, to start thinking and interacting a little bit differently. It was also a heads up for um, us in that nursing home that we had to make sure that um, he didn't have his trumpet in the middle of the night because he'd wake up and get the urge to play, you know, at 2 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so funny! I I think that's a that's an absolutely great story. Great, great story, and um, just those simple things of you know we're making these prejudgments that somebody can't do something anymore. 
um, when we really aren't even giving them the opportunity to explore. And maybe they are still interested. Maybe they still are capable. You know, it's just, it's it's so sad, um, the myths and the stigmas that are out there with this disease that are really holding people back from, from helping others. Um, sometimes yeah. we're, our, we're, we're the, our, our own worst enemy in terms of bringing comfort um, to somebody. And, you know, when they're comfortable and relaxed and having fun, um, we are then too. And um, so I think really keeping in mind of, of breaking down those barriers and and knowing that nothing is for sure with this disease, things ebb and they flow and they change. And, um, you know, like the movie you had talked about, um, about painting, you know, uh, Daniel uh, Potts' dad never painted. And, you know, mm-hmm. all of a sudden his paintings are on exhibit around the country. And so we don't know what skill levels are going to be and what's going to happen with this disease and, you know, allowing ourselves to be more spontaneous and non-judgmental and um, kind of removing that fear of failure because a lot of times we're setting it up um, because of our judgment. And, you know, if we don't look at failure um, as a, an inability of being able to do something, then it's just something we tried and it, you know, we don't have to put that pressure on ourselves. So I think that, that that's so cool that he, he picked up, you know, that instrument. Um, I, I can't even imagine how much joy that will give <laughs> the family the rest of their life, you know, and just a brilliant, brilliant story to say. Um, I'd like to pull in Harry Urban. He's on the line here and he has dementia and just Harry always has the, some input after he's listened to what's going on. What do you think about the concept of, of fit kits, um, Harry? Um, in- I like it. I, I like to add a couple of things, though. Um, now, I was I was diagnosed 11 years ago with Alzheimer's, so I look I look and think through the eyes of Alzheimer's. Okay, now if you want to engage with me, you have to come into my world. And you have to realize my world is a lot different than yours. Um, and I, I had I had uh, one woman tell me that her husband is always angry. Uh, I hate this disease. I hate what it's doing to us. You know, and I said, you know, I'm going to mimic you. You don't know how angry you are, you know, because it's so it's so common with you. So if you want to engage with me, let that anger out in your world. Don't bring it into mine. Uh, somebody else was, uh, uh, oh, I lost my train of thought. Um, oh, well. Harry, this, Karen, I wanted to just say that you are so right, and I am so glad you said the whole um, point about come into my world, um, mm-hmm. because that is, that is the foundation. I love that, and um, I don't know if you've heard about uh, the Virtual Dementia Tour, uh, P.K. Mm-hmm. Bevel um, design. And that's what it helps do for people is, you know, kind of help us come into the world because we don't know what you're experiencing and we do need to have that sensitivity. I'm not, I'm not a big fan of the virtual tours. Now, don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Um, because I lived this disease for so long, they're not natural to me. That, that's not that's not what it is. If you want to learn about my disease, talk to somebody that has dementia. They they will tell you. Um, and uh, I think I think those those tours are good, but but they're not they're not my day to day life. I had I had a woman tell me that. Um, uh, her husband won't talk to me. And uh, she said, you know, he, he is so far into this disease that uh, um, he just won't talk to me anymore. And, well, I said to her, I said, come into my world. Understand my world. Uh, number one, you're not going to engage with me if I don't understand you. I said, slow down. Slow down your speech. Uh, give me time to understand what you're saying, and then maybe, maybe after that, I can engage with you. 
And she said, well, she never thought of that. But she tried it, and, and it worked. I mean, like, <laughs> it, I mean, if somebody speaks too fast, of course I'm not going to understand. But it might be normal for them, but it's not my normal. Right. Mm-hmm. Oh, Harry, if I were in your same room with you, I'd give you a great big hug right now because um, you hit on another key element of um, communication. I mean, that is critically important. Um, another item I'll throw in besides, um, you know, slowing down is to speak in front of the person. You know, often we're, our backs are turned, um, but giving them, you know, the, your full face and kind of seeing the body language, all of that stuff at a subconscious level even, you know, helps with um, interpreting what is um, said. It also reminded me that people who, um, you know, well, the individual isn't, you know, talking back, he's not answering me. Well, the expressive ability um, to speak is lost much, much sooner than the receptive ability. In other words, people can hear and understand much longer in dementia. So if the individual is not, even though you've done these good communication techniques and the individual isn't responding, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're they're not hearing you. And, mm-hmm. you know, just, yeah, to No, did we lose her again? No, uh, no, no. Oh, I was. I didn't know if Harry was going to give us another wonderful um, point. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have so many. I can. Oh, I, I, I can take I up your whole hour, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, Harry, Kelly, I, I, I was going to say Kelly. that I love your your comment about come into my world um, from the emotional standpoint that. You know, if someone's, you know, angry and they're coming into your space, it's like dementia or not, I don't want to, it doesn't make me more inclined to want to converse, engage, and interact with you. So it's really, um, I think that's an important point is that we can often, I think as we begin to compartmentalize someone with any sort of diagnosis, we kind of label and put someone to the side and say, oh, these are assumptions we make about them. And I don't know, we're kind of presumptuous sometimes to come at someone however we are and assume that they'll want to interact with us. So I think that's an important point is to always be self-aware of how we are, what you know, energy we're giving off when we come up to someone, what we have on our mind or, you know, what our expectations are when we interact with them. I think that's really important and probably more so for someone who's living with dementia who's um, integrating and digesting information at a different rate um, than perhaps someone who doesn't have dementia. So I love that point. Thank you. Well, that, that's why it is so important that the care partner uh, takes care of themselves. Because they 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 live the stress of of uh, of this disease and it becomes their normal, okay. Right. And then they they come into my world and they carry that with them, and they don't even know how stressful they are. That's why it is so it is so important that that uh, you, I don't know how many care partners said it. I don't have time for that. You know, well, if you don't have time for that, then stay away from me because I don't want you to stress. <laughs> you know, that, that, that kind of, that's my philosophy, you know, and um, I don't know. It, it, it's kind of hard to understand. Oh, Harry, <laughs> you're a wise man. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's also, that's true, Harry, because in any – you know, if you read any successful people write a book, they always say, yeah, it's really hard to take mm-hmm. care of myself, and so therefore I have to write it on my schedule every day. It's part of my work schedule to whatever, take a walk or do meditation or write my goals or whatever it is they're going to do for success. And I think somehow um, in the role of care partner, um, professional or family members, there's a perception that that's not accepted to be able to set that time aside and say, no, this is part of my job. 
I must take care of myself in order to be um, balanced, happy, healthy, and, you know, good at this and really helpful. And it's just a perception, I think, culturally we have to start shifting that it is an important part of the role of anyone helping someone else is to take care of themselves. And that was one of the things, that was one of the benefits that we found with um, the sick kids is that, you know, in helping families um, and friends and um, others understand um, that when they connect, that it helps them feel good also. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's this paradox that while they're, you know, maybe setting out to engage, um, you know, the other individual, it has um, a backward effect as well. And, you know, it's important as caregivers, care partners, friends, um, you know, to also, as you say, Harry and Kelly, um, you know, to to be balanced and take care of our own well-being. Um, So really good points coming up today. Thank you. What, one good. thing I'm, I'm, I'm curious, too, is with the fit kits, do you find that um, somebody will get the fit kit and and, uh, and and give it to somebody with dementia, but then they do the fit kit themselves and don't let the dementia patient do it, like a puzzle. If you give, if you give me a puzzle, don't do my puzzle. <laughs> let me do it. You know, things, things like that. Uh, is that... Is that something with the fit kits that 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 you you try to explain that th- this is only a step, you know, let the person do it. You know, that sounds like a new caution we need to add because you did you hit on it, and puzzles the the worst item. That's what people tend to just jump in and start um, putting together. So yes, that's exactly right. It's um, you mm-hmm. know. Yeah, give just like you were saying with um, conversation, you know, give the individual time to process and respond back. Same thing with the items, you know, give them time to um, engage and figure out how they would like to to work with it. Um, yeah, you, you maybe you can be part of our. We have um, fit kit test crews, um, individuals. Maybe you can become part of our test crew if you're interested. That's a great job. <laughs> you, you, you may you may not like that. <laughs> Harry, it's it's important to get all perspectives, good and that's how you make it that's how we would make good changes to hear the really good feedback from the hard test crew. <laughs> but that, but that may- then make sure you give it to me on a good day. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and actually, Harry, that the, I actually noticed the opposite of that is that um, that people tend to it's just like giving you know the mother the art supplies and hoping that she'll know how to still work with them. I think sometimes mm-hmm. people get the fit kits and they think that because they've been researched and tested that they can just put the fit kit in front of somebody and then they'll just know what to do. But to someone at, you know, where you're at right now, you could still pick up the puzzle and, and begin the process. But for mm-hmm. as the, you know, as dementia advances into like the more moderate to advanced stages, that's when it requires the the person sitting and engaging to begin the puzzle, but then not do the whole thing. It's like begin the puzzle so that that person gets engaged, starts the process, and then being able to back off a little bit. And what I see more often than not is they put it in front of them and hope that, that it's going to happen, and they're just missing that key step of the the requirement of like you know it requires us to begin that engagement with them to trigger those the neural response you know to get that going for them. So there's that happy medium there, you know, not too much, not too little. Yeah, I'll, well, I'll bring. Find you... out. <clears throat> go ahead, Harry. Well, go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, okay. What what I find out, like with the uh, memory cafe to go to, is um, if you take if you take a box of dominoes, let's say, and uh, and you you lay them down, people's going to come up and they're going to start playing with the dominoes, but it just it opens up a conversation. Mm-hmm. You know, I think what it does is is playing with this stuff 
uh, give them something to do with their hands and lets their mind free that the conversation starts up. And, you know, like if, you, if, if, if I put down dominoes, nine times out of ten, you're not going to do anything. You're going to build something. You're going to build a wall, a tower, or something like that. But what you're doing, though, is you're talking. And, and and you start up a conversation. So so dominoes are, are that that's important. You know things like that 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 somebody can do, or somebody can have, and um, it it breaks the ice, like you said. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Well, we've only got about five minutes left, so I want to make sure um, Karen and Kelly with FitKits um, have had enough time to c- cover everything that they wanted. So is there is there anything else that you wanted to mention, Karen? Um, yeah, well, Harry triggered another thought when he was um, just talking, and that was um, how you utilize items um, can change, you know, sort of that no wrong way mentality. And I remember we were doing, um, working at an adult day center and, you know, helping the staff sort of expand their um, ideas of what are engaging. You know, everything shouldn't be in groups. You know, sometimes people would like to just do things Mm -hmm. either, you know, with one other person or um, individually. And so we were helping them think that through. And this one gentleman we had these Jenga blocks. No, no, if you're familiar, but they're um, well. The ones we were using were a natural color wood, and every piece, um, rectangular piece, was exactly the same size. And this gentleman, instead of um, you know the the Jenga game, which the staff kept wanting him to do, um, he had no interest in that. But he was he, he must have been an engineer. He had stat- he took great time and um, interest in stacking the pieces precisely, um, and it really was a marvel, almost an engineering marvel that he could do that. And once the staff realized that, I mean, I was like, look at him. He is really interested, and he ha- obviously has skill. It may not be doing what you thought he should be doing with them. So that's the other, um, I guess my last thing is, um, you know, to, to just, what, however, I've seen puzzle pieces, jigsaw puzzle pieces um, stacked. No interest whatsoever in doing the puzzle, but, you know, some pretty amazing things people have built with them. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. Yep, very true. I, I think to um, remove those stigmas of, of right and wrong and just to to allow creativity, we've gotten to be a society where we've we've really muffled that and kind of stomped it out. And and it's amazing what people can do if we just let them. <laughs> you know, if we just yeah. give them a safe, free space um, to to be creative and see what happens and and allow us all to go, wow, that was cool, or that was interesting, or well, that didn't that didn't work the way I thought it was going to. But you know, what a neat process. You know, just just to be, and we talk a lot about being in the moment, but um, as a society, we don't do that well. Um, I think we've got a really long, long ways to go, and, and I think it's neat that you've got kits that can help people be in the moment and give them a variety of of um, choices. And, and and again, with the um, ability to not even have to stay within those choices, these are just some ideas of how you might use these things. Um, but maybe you'll come up with some others, and that's okay too. Let us know what they are, and we'll add them. We'll add right. those uh, ideas and share those with others too, because it's it's not about the process so much. From what I'm hearing, it's about the engagement, um, and so we have to put the priorities in the right spot. So um, if people want to find out more about Fit Kits, they can go to www.fitkits.org. That's F-I-T-K-I-T-S dot org. Or you can email um, Kelly at Kelly at FitKits dot org or Karen at Karen at FitInteractive dot org. 
and um, they would be more than glad to uh, get you information. If you go to the website, you will uh, be able to actually visually see the the products, the 10 different products that they have, and um, they've got some video there in terms of how how they're used um, as examples. So wonderful work, ladies. Keep it up. I'm so glad to have you with us on the show today, and I, I really appreciate your time. Karen, do you want to give a plug for uh, your organization that you're rolling out to? I won't even, I'll, I'll just let you say it. We've got a minute to go here. Well, thank you so much for having Kelly and I on. We we love your radio program. You're doing amazing work. And um, I think you're referring to the Dementia Action Alliance um, mm-hmm. and Michael and, and you and um, a number of others. Um, it's a people's movement to um, you know, help change the conversation and expectations about dementia to improve things in our country. So, um, yes, we're so grateful that, um, you know, wonderful people like you are, are helping helping change things. It, it's time. We've gone too long in this nation doing things the same old way. It's time to make things better. Exactly, and exactly. Karen, just to note on that, that people can now go, the website for the Dementia Action Alliance is now live, and so there's more information on there, and there's also a lot of information about um, choosing language around uh, dementia. So that website is www.daanow.org. So if you're Wonder. interested in finding out more about that, you can go there. Wonderful. That's www.daa.now, or, or yep. I did that wrong, www.daanow.org. Um, it's a great site, um, lots of lots of excitement uh, rolling around this. And, again, I want to thank everyone for being with us today. Uh, again, you can check out FitKits at www.fitkits.org. Thanks for being with us today, everyone. Have a gr- brilliant week. Thank you. Hi, this is Suzanne Newman, host of the Answers for Elders podcast and radio show. We are the North Star that guides you through the complicated journey of senior care with trusted experts in money, law, living solutions, and more. So join us on this station, your favorite podcast channel, or just go to AnswersForElders.com. Meet the Way Showers who will help your journey a lot easier.